Hi everybody, just before we get started with this episode of Elwood City Limits, I wanted to let you know that you might be missing out on a really cool piece of ECL audio. Uh, right now, up there for patrons only is my interview with uh, an animator who has worked on Arthur in the past as a character designer, Mr. Rich Morris. So patrons will have access to that for about one week. Now you can wait another week and it's going to be on the free feed in place of next week's episode but if you can't wait if you want to hear that right now and trust me it's a really good interview he talks a lot about working on Arthur working on other Sinar projects like Mona the Vampire and the busy world of Richard Scarry among many others and you can also see his exclusive doodles and sketches from the show including character layouts that's all on patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits it only takes a dollar a month if you want to see this exclusively and right now Again, you can wait a week, or you can go there right now if you want to hear that exclusive audio. Don't worry, next week you'll be able to hear everything. But if you want it a little sooner, and if you want access to all our exclusive audio, patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. Wanted to make sure you knew about that before we get started with today's show. So I better mention it first up top, just so that we don't forget about it. Lucas, last week we were, uh, well, you uh, had your thoughts on the NBA, and uh, boy, howdy, looks like the looks like those Toronto Raptors are going places, aren't they? <laughs> well, uh, hindsight's hilarious, right? Because mm. I, I haven't gone back and listened to my thoughts, but I think I was. Um, I, I think I did allow myself to be a little optimistic, but I was definitely couching it in some some healthy skepticism. Uh, but uh, what actually ended up happening in reality, it must have been fun to listen to if you if you were following the NBA and you listened to that podcast when it was released after all that stuff had already taken place because it exceeded my wildest expectations. They built they they beat Milwaukee in Milwaukee. Uh, and then went on to beat them again in Toronto, finishing the series in six. And now, uh, my two favorite basketball teams of all time are facing each other in the NBA Finals, which is uh, pretty much something that I never in my wildest dreams expected. It's kind of a dream come true for me as a basketball fan. Uh, in the first games on Thursday, which again, will I think be in the past uh, when this episode <laughs> comes out. Right. Uh, and I don't even want to make a guess at any predictions at this point. I, uh, I, I, my, uh, uh, sort of Lucas Dobbs days are over. I am not even going to attempt to try and predict a, a game one of the finals. I will just say that I am looking forward to it. Well, it's just, I wanted to keep you honest with what you said in the past. I wanted to see, uh, have our listeners decide if, uh, if Lucas of, of uh, times past was uh, was right or wrong, and uh, yeah, it looks like uh, you're in for some good basketball, especially if those are your two teams. Those are uh, two good teams to have in the year 2019. Welcome, everybody. This is, in fact, Elwood City Limits. Believe it or not, it's the Episodic Arthur Podcast. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Will Young, and that, of course, is my co-host, Mr. Lucas Mancini. It's Elwood City Limits after dark. Yeah, we're... It's the... We're recording this at 8.41 p.m., which is a little late for us here on Elwood City Limits. It's the uh, After Dark special. Yeah, we really had... It's funny, we had the uh, the, sp- the spat of episodes where we were recording in the morning, and we were all, like, jazzed up and ready to go. And <laughs> I love those episodes. That's like... You can tell me and you used to work in radio, because we were definitely, like, channeling that zoo crew energy in those <laughs> morning episodes, yeah. where it's like, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, it's Elwood City Limits. Come you lie and and Uh, then this one uh much later and we've done other ones kind of late at night but i think the uh you and i kind of feel like the late night episodes are where we're just like yeah arthur did some i'm so tired oh what did he do i don't care like i I think i think it's i think it's a bell curve right like those those episodes we recorded in the morning were like super jazzed off the top Mm -hmm. uh and then those episodes we record right after we get home from work it's like yeah and then W did a thing, and and then Arthur did a thing, but then you like wait late enough, and then I'm just tired enough that I'm just loopy, and now I got that that night energy, baby. You know what I'm saying? I'm let the I'm letting the 
the midnight oil run or whatever you do with the midnight oil and uh um it's Elwood city limits after dark yeah exactly so uh you know might get up to some uh some some, uh, funny business that's that's right. I, I, exactly. Funny business. Funny business. Um, before we start the episode, of course, we always like to go over to our uh, emails, our mailbag. It's elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. We've got some uh, fantastic listeners out there, including yourself, and some of them like to correspond with us via email. Our first one comes in here. Uh, a couple of these... Uh, well, I, it's funny. There, with uh, every mailbag bash that we get, I feel like there's one that's specifically tailored towards you, Lucas. So this is definitely uh, one of those. Ooh, I'm excited. This is from Christine. Uh, Hi, Will and Lucas. As a lover of 60s mod fashion, I just wanted to let you know that the dress Muffy wears in the Crown City episode is a reference to YSL's Mondrian collection, in addition to being Ooh. a callback to the earlier episode with Binky and the sideways painting. So that was the one that was, uh, uh, you know, the painting that we couldn't remember. But uh, I've got the Wikipedia article here that Christine sent me. I'll shoot it over to you as well. The Mondrian collection of Yves Saint Laurent. And and, and then I, I assume that a cle- that collection is also in reference to said painting. Yes, yeah, big time. Okay, okay. it's a big it's a big part of it. It seems it's, it's the uh, it's the Wikipedia uh, cover photo here. So I'll, I'll send the okay. Let, yeah, let me see this yeah. uh, because um, I had the, that pe- painting again has been a, a cornerstone of Arthur. Oh my god, these are so cool. Oh, this is dope. Well, I'm glad this listener sent this in because this is like um, you're right. This is certainly a me email. Well, you've you you've um, more got the eye towards fashion than I do. That's for sure. Uh, uh, oh yeah, this is cool. But yeah, Piet Mondrian, he's a Dutch painter, and he pa- also painted that painting. Mm. Um, from the episode where Binky uh, is the only one who knows. It's called Tableau 1. Tableau 1. And Binky's, Binky's the Oh, actually, no. The one Binky might see is actually maybe Composition 2. Ooh. All these paintings kind of look the same. Ooh. I don't want to say. But it's it's one of this guy's paintings. Uh, and uh, Binky's the only one that realizes it's it's upside down. Cool. This is neat stuff. Christine continues, after collaborating with icons like Barbie and Mickey Mouse, it only seems right that Moshino creates an Arthur collection next. Any other designers you think would collaborate with Arthur? Will we see Will and Lucas rocking $1,000-plus-dollar designer versions of Arthur's signature yellow sweater? That's from Christine. So, uh, designers, Lucas, again, you kind of have a bit more of the fashion mind yeah. than I do. I could see, uh, I could see, uh, you know, you could see Pharrell working with Arthur. Pharrell did his oh, like SpongeBob yeah. collection. That stuff was pretty cool. I would love to see like Bape X Arthur. Uh, you know, like seeing like, uh, uh, I mean, Arthur's got many uh, uh, primate characters, so you could incorporate them in some Bape designs. Um, but it's it's not exactly high fashion. I would actually love to see uh, Uniqlo do a t-shirt collab with Arthur. Uniqlo has been killing the t-shirt collabs lately. They just did a Disney one. Uh, they did a Capcom one before that. Mm. Uh, they announced a Blizzard Games one today. Um, uh, you know, they, they have a Marvel one that's been ongoing. So Uniqlo has been killing. The, I, I'm a personal favorite. I own a couple of pieces from the uh, the show and jump one. Um, so again, not exactly high fashion. They're like $20 t-shirts. But Uniqlo, Japanese, uh, uh, basically a Japanese Gap, have been killing the t-shirt collab game. I would love to see them do something with Arthur. In terms of high fashion, um, uh, hmm, 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 hmm. I would say like, I don't know. I, I think Arthur kind of looks like he's wearing Raph Simmons. Like if you were to Google, like, like it, it, you know the, that meme where it's like someone takes a really simple outfit and then they like try and break it apart with a bunch of like really high fashion clothes and they say how much it would cost so for instance they'll be like you want to dress like hank hill and they'll like bring up like a gucci plain white t-shirt yeah, that's yeah. like a thousand dollars um you could do a really good one of those with like arthur's outfit and like raf simmons so i guess i'll say that one all right uh i don't really have anything much to add to that i mean listen i dressed in the i dress in the finest wrestling shirt and walmart chic 90 percent of the time and the the other and the other 10 percent i'm wearing work clothes so i really don't have a place in this but i appreciate the question christine and i knew that lucas would have some thoughts on that himself 
Listen, Kendall Jenner was once photographed wearing a NWO uh, wolf. Yeah, she shirt, was. That's so right. You, you, you're, uh, you're on your way to uh, uh, the Fashion Week, as far as I'm concerned. Well, thank you, thank you. Our next one is from John Arthur Watcher since 1996, who wants to know our thoughts on whether or not the show will have any other LGBT related storylines, whether about gay rights or pride. And if you could see any other characters established or new come out in future episodes. Um, it's a good question. Um, I, I wonder, I, I really hope that the recent controversies, about the Mr. Ratburn episode. And if you're not familiar with those, check out our last episode. We talked about it at length at the very beginning. Um, I hope it doesn't make them gun shy to tackle anything else like that. And because uh, new this week, not only is Alabama public television taking the episode out of rotation, but uh, so is Arkansas. So unfortunately kind of spreading Um, in terms of, if they like, if they will ever have any other LGBT related storylines, that would be really cool. Um, I like I said, I hope it doesn't kind of uh, spoil the water for doing it later. All of this kind of uh, controversy. Uh, any other esta- characters established or new come out in future episodes? I mean, again, I'd be all for it. I just I wonder if there would be. Um, I mean, I'm I'm sure there's possibilities. I'm not thinking of, but uh, um. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard for me to say. I would. Uh, I would really like to hear from some of our listeners on the LGBTQ uh, plus spectrum. What? Uh, what? Which characters would you like to see uh, representative of the community, or what types of storylines do you think would be appropriate uh, and realistic for Arthur to tackle? I don't know if I, I can really answer that one. I. I, I mean, again, I, I think you know as much representation as possible. The more, the better. Uh, I actually, it's funny, it's a little bit of an aside, but uh, recently I was covering a, a Ramadan iftar for uh, my internship uh, at, on this university campus, and I, um, it got me thinking about, uh, is there a, a Muslim Arthur character? Because, of mm. course, you know, Brain, Brain celebrates uh, uh, Kwanzaa, and, and Francine uh, is Jewish, and so I was like, I wonder if there's a Muslim Arthur character, and after a, just a quick Google search I just did... Um, it's actually, again, props to Arthur. It already has it covered. There is indeed, uh, a Muslim Arthur character. Oh. It's Arthur's pen, Arthur's pen pal, Adil. Oh, Adil? Adil, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, he is from Turkey and he, uh, celebrates Ramadan and, and is, is Muslim. So, um, because I was going to say that, that was going to be my suggestion is not necessarily a new LGBT character I, as much as that would be welcome. But I, I was thinking, like, if one of the gang was uh, a Muslim, that, because, again, doing some research about this Ramadan celebration and stuff, I realized uh, how much I had forgotten or how little I knew in the first place about Islam. And so it got me thinking about it. I thought there'd be good to have an Arthur character like that. And it turns out there already is. So uh, once again, we say on our Arthur podcast, well, G. Willikers isn't Arthur great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, as always, I say more representation uh, is always a good thing. Uh, bring it all on. I would love to see it. And uh, hopefully that's where it's trending. Uh, next one comes in from Yoshi, longtime listener Yoshi. Uh, who uh, says that my family has always operated under the assumption that Rapper was gay. I couldn't even tell you why. He just was. And I'm grateful to the adults of my life for talking about it like it was no big deal. As a person who's been questioning her own sexuality, as a lifelong Arthur lover, and as a teacher, it was beyond wonderful to have confirmation of what I've been seeing for so long. I also think it's great that a character who has such a positive impact on the show, as well as the best intentions for the kids' education, turned out to be gay. It's someone they know and love, and we still know and love no matter what. Now for the episode itself, what did you think? I wish we'd gotten to see a little bit more of Patrick, but I also liked how it wasn't a big fanfare. Hopefully he doesn't turn into another throwaway character of the week. Also, Mr. Ratburn inviting only students to his wedding? Relatable. Uh, I bring this up just because I um, I am planning a little something with, uh, with a certain someone about doing the episode in full. So we will be doing that. My, my original plan was to do that the week it came out. But uh, it didn't. It uh, didn't end up. Uh, it 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 just didn't end up surfacing. So we will be hopefully doing it very soon. Myself and a special guest, Lucas. Did you have you gotten to see it yet? The uh, the full episode. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, no, I've only seen that ending clip thus far, so I'm not sure what else the episode entails. Okay. Well, I'll just say in brief, I did like the episode, and I also hope that Patrick sticks around. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ratburn's uh, husband. He uh, seems like a real nice guy. And finally, this one is from Matthew. Uh, Hey, guys, I live in Florida, but most of my relatives live in Ottawa, and I travel to visit them every summer. I love hearing you guys talk about Canada as well as Arthur, and I was wondering if where you were growing up, you ever had a channel that played Arthur episodes in French. Whenever I visited my cousins when I was younger, I noticed certain programs, such as Franklin, had both English and French airings on different channels, but I never picked up on whether or not that was true for Arthur. Uh, Thank you, Matthew. Yes, it absolutely was. Uh, Channel 2. Uh, when I still had cable, and this was like this was before you could you could scroll down to like pick. Oh, I want to go to channel five sixty four. No, 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 no. You had channels two to seventy, and you liked it. And if you wanted to know what was coming up next, you either went to channel eight to see the scrolling guide, or you bought a TV guide at your local supermarket. Yeah, Channel 2, it was always when I was, like, bored of literally everything else on the other, like, 20 channels. And so I would be like, well, this is Arthur. I can't understand what's going on, but at least it's a cartoon. Um, I remember all the voices. I I think this was common amongst a lot of, like, French dubs of uh, cartoons. All the voices seemed a lot deeper. Yeah, and or they're either – it's kind of like watching – it's kind of like watching Dragon Ball Z in Japanese. It's like some of the voices are way higher than you expect or way lower. It's – it, like I, I I won't even try to t- imitate it because I can't really speak French. But it's I remember it made me laugh when I was a kid just because it sounded completely wrong, uh, based on what I knew Arthur to be. Uh, also Franklin, the uh, TV show Franklin is uh, Benjamin in in French. I remember watching that in French class. Oh, Benjamin. Uh, it reminds me of uh, there's a really great YouTube video that's like the scene uh, in SpongeBob where they're like door to door chocolate salesman and the guy freaks out at them. Yeah. Um, and it's like that scene in like 20 different languages. So if you ever wanted to see like the Portuguese dub of SpongeBob and have the guy be like chocolate, yeah. chocolate, and like yelling at them, chocolat, uh, vous uh, dites <laughs> chocolat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, um, that's that, that's what that kind of stuff makes me think of. <laughs> Uh, so yes, that was definitely one of the many French programs on our on uh, good old Channel Two. Uh, thank you everybody for your emails over at ElwoodCityLimits at gmail dot com, and uh, we want to say an special thank you to our patrons who uh, make this show and all of our patron co- our Patreon content possible. That is before you get to the patrons. Before you get to the patrons. Uh, if you want to sign up for the Patreon to, uh, of course, get access to the filibusters and our review of Detective Pikachu and our commentaries of uh, uh, the made-for-TV Arthur movies, you could do all that. But more importantly, you're going to be contributing to the fund to make Will and I go see uh, Sonic the Hedgehog in theaters and review it like we did with Detective Pikachu. And... You're in luck because the time limit has been extended. <laughs> uh, the movie got pushed back to February, so we have even more time to read. What's the goal again, Will? Is it 40? It's 40. Oh, my goodness. We could get to 40 Patreon subs by by February. So if you haven't already, subscribe to the Patreon. We will force Will to see the new and improved version of Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm almost sad that it won't be as bad. It, uh, I, I get the feeling I'm going to get some coal in my stocking via more money somehow uh, by Christmas this year. So, yeah, if you want to make me suffer, go ahead. Patreon.com slash LWC limits. Okay. Uh, our lovely patrons, including, and of course, you can get your uh, name right on the air, usually, if I remember to do it, if uh, you are one of our patrons, like Caitlin Harrington, Chandler LaFave Bowden, Christine Wong, Christopher Ifill. Crescent Fresh, Dan Mike Dawson Silva, Emily K, Froppy, Gerjolt Sangha, Ian Collins, excuse me, Ian Collis, my God, uh, Jake Bailey, Joe Sue, John Dulong, John Griswold, Kaylin Krogull, Kaylin, I didn't even have to look at your old email this time. I'm getting it. I'm getting better at it. Kevin Noon, Leanne S, Light Relentless, Macy Ball, Passion Fruit Pavlova, Riley Stevens, Ross Ward, Sam Solero, Shayna Bennett, Stella, and Teresa. Thank you, everybody. Brought to you by viewers like you and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation. No, not really. 
All right, so it's time to get into another episode of Arthur. This is season seven, and uh, we're starting off with To Tibble the Truth, but we're actually starting off in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. What? Huh? <laughs> we're starting off in Ancient Greece, homie. Oh, I see. I was like, I did not play Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I was actually, this was, um, look at Arthur teaching me things. Uh, how do you pronounce this again? Di- Dio, uh, Dio- Diotenes? I heard Diogenes. 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 How much die would an Ogenes die if an I Diogenes died? We whoa. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was not. F- Don't hurt. I Don't was hurt. not familiar with the story of Diogenes, uh, and I went to Wikipedia mm. to read about yes. it, and I was like, "This is really cool. I, this is something I would. This is definitely one of those Wikipedia articles I would like come across and like read the whole thing out of interest." So. The inventor of uh, being cynical, Diogenes, the inventor of the the cynic philosophy, and all he wants to find is a, uh, uh, you know, an honest man. Yeah, um, I feel like I have studied Diogenes in my first year of university, and uh, I I absolutely got his name wrong. I thought it was Diotenes, but it is abs- it is definitely Diogenes. You know, if I were any good at my job, I would have probably looked that up. But nope. Uh, thank you for filling in, though, Lucas. Um, yes, and Diogenes is looking for uh, someone who is all someone who is always honest. I forget the exact wording. Of who he's looking uh, for. An honest man. An honest man. Not even always honest, just honest in general. Uh, he made a virtue of poverty. He begged for a living. And get this, he slept in a large ceramic jar in the marketplace. How? Like... I, I, it was a really big jar. It would have to be. I mean, my goodness. Like, is he is he sleeping, like, folded up like uh, that kid in Freddy vs. Jason? And yeah, he became notorious for his philosophical stunts, such as carrying around a lamp during the day, claiming to be looking for an honest man. <laughs> well, there- but get get this! You're, oh my goodness, the, this is. I'm more I read about this Diogenes guy, the more I like him. He criticized Plato, so he's like already beefing with Plato, disputing his interpretation of Socrates, and sabotaged his lectures. Sometimes distracting listeners by bringing food and eating during the discussions. This guy sounds like the Tyler, the creator of ancient Greece. He was also noting for having mocked Alexander the Great, both in public, and to his face. All right. If I keep this open, I'm just going to be reading the, the Wikipedia article for the Diogenes. The whole Di- episode, Diogenes but... an odd future eating during Plato's uh, Plato's lectures. What a what a rebel. Uh, oh my god, okay, one last thing about this Wikipedia article. So, if you were wor- wondering about where he slept, there is a painting of the giant ceramic jar. Uh, it's called Diogenes Sitting in His Tub. Uh, and this is... I'm gonna send you this real quick. No, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to describe I, this. I got, it, I got it here. Okay, you're looking what I'm looking at? Because I'm looking at the newest art piece that I'm gonna be hanging in my... Uh, <laughs> this is what I think. I think I believe this is what the uh, the kids would refer to as a big mood. <laughs> He's sitting in a large man sized jar with several dogs uh, looking on. In fact, Diogenes is followed by a rather sickly looking dog in this Arthur cold open. It's a bit of the bit of the uh, the Grinch and Max uh, uh, vibe going on here. Yeah, okay, that that jar is big enough to live in, and you know, honestly, <laughs> if the rent isn't that bad, I don't blame him. Oh my god, if that jar was in Vancouver, it's like a $1,400 jar. <laughs> uh, yeah, imagine the parking for that jar in Toronto. <laughs> Forget about it. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, he's on the lookout for an honest man. Uh, he thinks he's found it in whatever the uh, uh, the the, Gre- the Grecian equivalent of Arthur would be, perhaps Alpha. But then Delta Omega, a.k.a. DW, uh, rats on him and... To, and tells Diogenes where to go to find an honest man. So he goes on this very harrowing trip with his dog and then finds his way into a cave where he finds the ancient Greece, the Grecian equivalent of the Tibble twins who uh, immediately are fighting over his lamp and uh, end up smashing it by accident. What a, what a pull this cold open was like, what a, what a trip. It's quite the gag. 
Like, the whole point is, like, some Arthur writer, like, learned about Diogenes in some class, just like you did. Uh, and he remembered that all he wanted was someone who, like, told the truth. And they they were like, okay, we need a cold open for this episode. It's about the Tibble Twins lying. And this guy was like, my time to shine. And, of course, kids, you can find out more about Diogenes by visiting your local library. Um, so, yes, this episode, if you couldn't tell from the title, it is all about the Tibble Twins. And... Um, we see them immediately right in their element as the episode begins. They're spinning a yarn to Buster, who's enjoying some ice cream in the park, about a friend of theirs who was abducted by aliens, and uh, we, and when he did, could not supply them ice cream. This is a this is quite the tale, and of course, Buster, uh, very very gullible. You know, at some point he does it to himself. You know what I mean? I feel like Buster like wants to believe this. Oh, absolutely. He's lo- he's just looking for opportunities. And the Tibbles, th- this is a perfect the perfect mark to sharpen their lying abilities. Like th- there's a point where Buster almost catches them in the lie and then they just kind of build on it. They're just like, "Hey, wait a minute. If your friend was abducted, how do you know all this?" And then they're like, "Well, that's because some of the animals are aliens and you can hear them talk if 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 you listen really carefully and Buster gets freaked out and they get to pounce on his ice cream uh, it's uh, quite a, a little a, almost a little scary how good at lying they are in fact they continue it by uh by um going into the yard of Visita who we see again which was very nice um she has a bionic bunny with like a jetpack and like sunglasses and what? And they really want to play with it. They saw the commercial on TV, but they uh, want to try and spirit it away from Visita. So they lie to her about how they got three different po- ponies for Christmas, but they can't play with them all. So they're going to have to let one of them go. Uh, Thumper is its name, if I remember correctly. Yes, it is Thumper. And so Visita, of course, she is only three and a half. So uh, she is immediately believes them and trades the bionic bunny for access to thumper but then she says it's not even her bionic bunny it's uh, alberto's so uh unfortunately she gives that away when she really shouldn't have and the, and of course the boys end up uh i believe i believe they like throw it out a window yeah they wanted to see if it would fly just like in the commercial uh and it, it again running gag and arthur throwing toys that are not supposed to be thrown out a window out a window uh, and then be destroyed. And they throw out... The, their timing could not be worse because Alberto and... Uh, uh, Mrs. Tibble. Mrs. Tibble are walking by just as this happens, just in time to see the crash. So it's it's really not left up to the imagination who threw it out the window. And we kind of get a smash cut to uh, Mrs. Tibble confronting uh, the Tibbletons with Alberto in tow. Uh, their defense, I wrote it down, is it's the TV's fault. The TV lied to us. It's uh, It was interesting to see the Tibbles actually kind of get in trouble for something that they did from Mrs. Tibble because it seems like she has a real long leash with them. But uh, I guess there is a bit of a limit, even if they end up squirming out of it. So they end up breaking the toy. Uh, which apparently cost Alberto seventeen ninety five, which in two thousand two was probably would probably get you like a deluxe toy. So that's a, probably a pretty good one. Ooh, what's seventeen ninety five and twenty nineteen dollars? Let's see. Mm. Uh, USD inflation calculator. You keep talking while I do this because so, the, the, the people need to know. So Alberto is really upset with the Tibbles, of course, because they broke his toy. And he, instead of paying them back, they offer they offer him. It's like he, hey, here's a plastic cow that if you squeeze it, it goes moo. And Alberto says, "I'm 13. You really think I want to play with a plastic cow?" Which I kind of like that line. Um, but Alberto says, "You don't have to pay me back, but if you only promise, if you promise to stop lying and always tell the truth, then uh, then I'll forgive you the debt." And they do, and uh, they pretty much. They're just like, yeah, 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 whatever. That like, we're we're cool. Uh, but eighteen. So yeah. I rounded it up to eighteen for simplicity's sake. Eighteen dollars in two thousand two would be twenty five dollars and fifty seven cents in twenty nineteen. So that's not nothing. Uh, that's a that's a that's a bionicle right there, baby. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So the the Tibbles kind of hastily promise that they won't lie so that they get out of trouble. The next scene is them playing rock ball. Uh, with uh, DW, which is basically taking like a, a baseball bat and just hitting hitting it with rocks and just like 
So their idea of not lying is twisting around what they've said. It's real like word manipulation. They're just like, we're not supposed to play baseball in the yard, but there aren't any bases with what we're playing, and we're playing with rocks, so it's not baseball. And it's like, well, it's not really the spirit of the law. They're really twisting the letter around. <laughs> and of course, they end up uh, they end up uh, cracking. A, well, DW ends up uh, batting a rock, and it hits Alberto in the head. So poor guy, he really is getting the short end of the stick here. Yeah, we need we need like a like Animal House style, uh, you, you know, freeze frame. Uh, the Tibbles went on to become lawyers or something. Well, because that's what I'm really getting from this. Well, I'm really surprised here because they go from, of course, lying to people a lot, which is one thing, and then they go to this really like serpentine twisting of what they like twisting of the truth. And I wonder, like, where did the Tibbles learn to be like? amoral like it's one thing for them to be like mischievous little boys but this is like you know getting into like you know real like really greasy territory here like they're like dirty little liars these guys where did they learn this where did they pick this up this is like proper all the tv they're watching they're uh oh you ready for some really sick edgy uh daily show humor bro okay uh they're they're probably watching c-span and learning from congress <laughs> Ooh, yeah who are the real Damn. who are the real liars on tv you be the judge <laughs> it's there's the twitter account that like there's a twitter account out there i don't know if they're still doing this that it used to you know how com- uh comedies always say they're the number one comedy of america yeah uh, it would always change this, but it would tweet whatever a comedy was saying it was the number one comedy of America, and it'd be like, oh, uh, you know, what's what was a recent comedy? Like, I don't know, like uh, uh, Game Night. Game Night says it's the one, number one comedy in America, but have they checked the White House? And it, 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 uh, it just made that exact same tweet over and over and over again. That's really funny. Is it still active? I have no idea. I haven't checked it on it in a very long time. <laughs> All right, I want to. I want to. I want to see if I can find that. That's. I like that. Um. So essentially, Alberto's very frustrated with them, but he just says, "You know what? I give up," and walks away. And the Tibbles are like, "Yeah, we got off scot free. We didn't even get in trouble." DW lays down this this whopper of a line right here. She says, "I wouldn't be surprised if you two ended up in jail someday." Which is I savage. Yes. Way harsh. Uh, in fact, they the Tibbles go to bed thinking about what is jail and the, <laughs> thinking about jail. <laughs> well, and well, because uh, Timmy asked Tommy what it is, and Tommy's like, "That's where adults go when they're bad." So I heard that some some adults even go there for ten years, and Timmy's like, "I've been in, I was in timeout for ten minutes one time, but ten years." And then they end up having a nightmare. They have like a. Uh, same nightmare in two different brains, like the brothers in Boondock Saints, and uh, it's about th- be- them being in jail. Uh, and they're they're introduced to our throwaway characters of the week. Oh wow! Okay. I felt like this time it was okay to, uh, uh, even though it's multiple characters, they're all kind of like one collective. Yeah, you don't see them apart. The pr- uh, the, pr- the prison the, system. That's your it, throwaway character it, of the week. Exactly. The throwaway character of the week is the other prisoners in the jail. Uh, they're drawn in a really strange way where, like, they don't even look like... Usually in cases like this, uh, they would just throw in, like, stock, like, okay, here's a gray bunny. Uh, but these characters, like, are... Someone had fun drawing these rough-and-tumble prisoners that are supposed to be in scaring the Tibble Twins straight. Uh, so they, they're like arguing over a harmonica in their bed and then the guy from the top bunk just reaches over and breaks it with his fist and then they go to they have a visitor so they walk by all of these prisoners there's a great line here from one of them he says hey look it's the two half truths that's not bad I, I, I thought that was kind of clever anyway uh, their Mrs. Tibble visits them in prison and she uh baked a pie for them and because they say that the prison food is really terrible but then she says but what if the prison food is actually quite good oh i wish i could believe you and then there's a great little bit of animation where she like swings her legs around the back of the bench she's on and then promptly gives the pie to the guard and he eats it in front of them 
So they realize in their very childish way that they need to start telling the truth and being honest all the time. But of course, they kind of interpret it in their very um, hardline way. So what that means is, uh, well, well, the first thing we see is that they, you know, later on in the real world now, outside of the dream, they end up eating a whole plate of cookies, then confessing that they did when somebody asked them. And then it's like, oh, this was actually a, a market test uh, to see if those cookies were any good. Uh, here, have some more. And they're like, hey, we should be honest all the time. And then this episode turns into uh, Liar Liar nah. or Yes Man yeah. or uh, any other Jim Carrey movie where he has to tell the truth the whole time and he used to lie all the time. You know, I never realized that th- that he made two movies with nearly a, the, nearly the exact same premise. Uh, yeah, the the exact same premise. About, around a, based around a verbal contract. One of them he's in a okay, so one of them he's a lawyer. L- I think that's, it's Liar that, Liar. That's Liar he's Liar. A lawyer. Yeah. Is he in Yes Man? I don't know. Uh, All I remember about the movie Yes Man is like the part from the trailer where he's like, he drank a Red Bull and he's like acting high. He's like, I've been drinking Red Bull all night. I really like Red Bull. Like, remember, like, hey, remember Jim Carrey movies <laughs> when he like used to act like Jim Carrey? Well, if I don't. It's back, yeah. If I don't, right. if I don't see Sonic the Hedgehog, I won't have to. They what what they interpret this as is that in their own hardline way, as I kind of said earlier, um, they need to be completely brutally honest with people all of the time. So we get this montage of them going around to everybody they know and just blurting out all of these honest but really mean things to like they go to DW and they're just and they're just like you're too bossy and you listen to Crazy I- Bus too much. I loved this part. Speaking of political humor, all of these things that they say uh, sound like Trump tweets. Uh, like when they go up to like Arthur and they're like, "Your nose is too small." It's like if Arthur was running against Trump in the in, in the election, he'd be like, "Small nose, Arthur. He's got a small nose. He's nearsighted. His vision's very poor." Um, that brain, like, yeah. that brain's head is too big. It's too it's big. Too, it's, it's too big. His head's too big. His head's too large. Buster, so gullible Buster. Like, there's a really great Wikipedia article out there that's just a list of Trump insults. Oh, great. Uh, like, like nicknames that tr- Trump has bestowed on his opponents. You know, uh, Crazy Birdie. Lion Hillary. Uh, uh, Lion, uh, um, what, oh, Frig, what's the Ted Cruz one? Is it? I don't know. Lion Ted? Ah, oh, God. I, I'm not going to look it up, but the Ted Cruz one always makes me laugh. Uh, low energy, uh, <laughs> low energy gem. Uh, all those, all those things. Uh, And so, like, they're basically using the Trump method of nicknaming people when they refer to, uh, uh, you know, uh, DW and Arthur and having a small nose and all that stuff. I I quite enjoyed it. My favorite one, other other than them walking into Brain's mom's ice cream shop, saying to Brain that his head is too big and running away. My other favorite one is when they're talking to DW... Mom Reed come comes up and they say, "Hi, Mrs. Reed. Your house smells like dog." <laughs> some I thought that was really funny. Yeah, some hot takes in this episode from uh, DW and then the Tibbles, uh, and then they realize that everybody they they're like fielding phone calls at the end of the day of people saying that they won't be friends with them anymore. Yeah, Emily called. Like, yes, th- yeah. The delivery of that line is really great too because th- he's like, "Oh, that was Emily on the phone." She, he says it almost that he's not trying, like, he doesn't actually, like, understand. It hasn't sunk in yet. He's like, that was Emily on the phone. She says she doesn't want to see us ever again. Well, and he end, he ends the phone call with, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. Which is like, oh, man. I'm glad the Tibbles are kids, because if they were like this as adults, they would be insufferable. Um, And they are, they get very mad at each other, the Tibbles do, for deciding to be honest. And Timmy says, again, another really hot take in this episode. He's just like, sometimes I wish that I never had a twin, and that's the truth. Yeah, pulling the Brie Bella. I wish you died (laughs) in the womb. I I hope people remember that in five years, because (laughs) I feel like people are already starting to forget the the infamous Bella Twins feud where was it Brie who said I wish no, you died no, in the womb? No, 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 Nikki said it. Nikki said I wish you died in a womb and and Brie was on the she was a fan, remember? She had to show up to a, an event as a fan because yeah. they wouldn't give her a ticket 
and then she slapped Nikki when Nikki said she wished she died in the womb. But she said it weird. She was like, in the womb. In the womb. <laughs> and there was like a guy in the background who like loses it. Yeah. That's my favorite part about that whole clip. I, he might even be a plant, but there's a guy like, right a plant, next yeah. to them who's like going off. Uh, can I tell you my favorite part of last year, the Nikki Bella, the Nikki Bella Ronda Rousey feud? Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, so they had some uh, scare quotes, great promo exchanges. And my favorite thing was like I was watching this with my friend at the time, and Ronda Rousey's cutting this promo on Nikki Bella, and out of nowhere, she just says, "I will ruin you." <laughs> It's so funny. It's still really funny. It's just what? Gosh, I forgot even. I forgot that feud even happened. I will ruin you. It just never fails to make me laugh. It was so over the line. Um, yeah. So this uh, causes a rift between the t- Tibble twins, as you would expect. Tommy's very broken up about it. Uh, so they're just kind of not playing with each other on the steps the next day. Alberto comes by. He's wearing a bicycle helmet in case he gets hit with another rock. And, Can I, and also at this moment is when I realized, you know, Alberto and his sister, they add a lot to the Arthur canon. Like, I love having them in the neighborhood. Yeah, it, uh, it's good to have a character that isn't, like, directly one of the main cast of kids, of El, of Lakewood Elementary kids. Like, he's another kid from the neighborhood, but uh, him just being in this situation kind of fleshes it out a little bit more. Also, the only teenage brother. All the other teenage characters in the show are women. That's right. Great point, actually. Uh, so he, so Tommy and Timmy say that they, you know, are upset with each other because they were uh, being honest all the time. But then, of course, Alberto says, you know, being honest all the time doesn't mean like just saying anything that that just blurting out anything that comes into your head. There's, you know, you can also be honest while being nice at the same time. And that's and that's kind of what they needed to understand. And I do like the gradient that we get in their behavior from this episode, from you know straight up lying to giving the harsh truth to being truthful but harsh. And then at the end, they kind of understand you know the combination of not lying to people and being nice. So there's actually a really sweet moment here near the end where Timmy says, "You know what? Most of the time, I really like having a twin. You're my best friend in the whole world, and it seems really genuine." And I felt like that was long overdue for the Tibbles. Like, we've only kind of seen them as, like, monsters and, you know, like, bratty little kids. But it's, you know, it's it's just nice to be confirmed. Like, yeah, they are each other's best friend. And the episode ends, again, with them kind of hoodwinking Buster. Uh, but in a different way, they, uh, they compliment him. They say, you're so nice and generous and are always very sharing... And, and always share like your candy and stuff. And Buster's like, "Wow, I'm a role model." Do you want some? Gu- I love that. Like, I, and all these like little like asides with the Tibble Twins interacting with Buster. He's just like sitting on a park bench eating. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, he's like, "Do you want some gummy worms?" And the Tibbles take him for everything that he that he has. So it's just like th- there's actually a really funny exchange as they walk away, and it's just like, "Boy, telling the truth and being nice is really great." Is that what adults call flattery? <laughs> it's like, ah, so they've discovered another way of deceiving people. Great. But at least the lesson, hopefully, for the younger kids watching it is a little bit clearer. And that's the end of our foray into the Tibbles. Before we get uh, up to the next part of the episode, let's hear from us. And now a word from me, Lucas Mancini of Elwood City Limits. Don't forget to chat with your Elwood City Limits pals on social media with Facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits or at ECL Podcast on Twitter. We also have a Tumblr, ElwoodCityLimits.tumblr.com, and an Instagram, at Elwood City Limits. If you want to send us a question, send us an email and get it read on the show at ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. You can find the entire episode archive at elwoodcitylimits.libsyn.com or on your favorite podcast service. If we aren't on your preferred podcast app, let us know, and we'll do our best to get on it. Thanks, as always, for supporting us here at Elwood City Limits. Now, back to the show. And we're back. This one, people have been excited for us to talk about and boy, so was I, because once again, we got a binky episode in our hands, and it's called Waiting to Go. 
In fact, it, uh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, episode starts off, Brain got the new Apple Watch. <laughs> now, the Apple Watch, uh, I will say, or whatever this watch is that he has, it seems to have the same interface as like a Windows 3.5. Like, you could probably play Chip's Challenge on that baby. Well, okay, so keep it with the Greek. Remember, um, I feel like this was a really season one thing where um, the two episodes they would pair to make, the two stories they would pair to make a full episode, the two 10-minute stories, like sometimes they would kind of have like a running theme that would like, okay, that's why they put these two episodes together. And I feel like near the end of season one, the start of season two, we started to talk about how like, it would be a very, very, like, one thing would show up in both the episodes. And so they were like, let's put these two together because this one thing shows up in both of them. And these both episodes kind of have, like, historical intros. It's, like, such a loose, uh, 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 it, it, it's just, like, a, such a loose basis to, like, join these two episodes together. I'm not even sure if that's what they were thinking, but it reminded me of that, of, like, in season one where we started to be, like, they mentioned this thing in both these episodes, so maybe that's why these ones are together. Yeah, you're right. There is a bit of a loose connection here because it's uh, Brain showing off a computer program on his watch, and it is like the screen is huge. It looks like the screen on an iPod Classic, and it's a uh, very blocky computer program where Einstein is telling uh, him the time. Uh, is is he in Greece to start off with? Oh, yeah, because Einstein, like, goes to all the places. Maybe that's what I was thinking, because it was also in Greece. But I'd have to... I don't have the episode in front of me. I'd have to go back and watch it again, because that would even add uh, uh, to my theory. He's got the pillars in the back, so it actually might be Rome or some such, but one one of those. Anyway, Brain is completely enamored with this new watch, uh, but it turns out he's, t- he's showing this to Arthur uh when they're in the middle of a soccer game and he's continuing to read out different times and different places did you notice trevor on the stands no i didn't what oh man he's back to coaching that's awesome thank goodness uh so binky's binky's lining up a shot and brain who is completely absent-minded uh just kind of runs runs into binky yeah runs into binky and his watch ends up getting smashed and uh, and Brain ends up being very angry with Binky to the point of just, like, you know, communicating through Arthur to get, like, you know, Arthur, tell Binky. And I'm like, Brain, you got no leg to stand on, bro. Like, Yeah, I, I, I understand, like, I understand what this episode's going for, and it's, like, necessary for them to be mad at each other for the, uh, the episode. But I feel like it would have worked a little bit better if, like, somehow Binky had also done something uh, like they need to both kind of be in the wrong, and in this case, Brain is a million percent the only one who did something wrong, and Biggie was like completely innocent. It's not even that, like you know, he he didn't like wrong, like he messed up Binky's shot, yes, but it's like Binky didn't do anything wrong. Brain just wasn't paying attention, so it's his own fault. Uh, but he is he's misplacing his anger toward Binky. Uh, so it's the end of the soccer game. Everybody's kind of getting their drives home. Arthur, thankfully, doesn't have to be in the middle of them for much longer. Uh, so they're kind of waiting for their drives. And this is this is basically where the episode stays. Is this the parking lot of the soccer field as Brain and Binky wait for their parents to pick them up? It's like it's a real bottle episode in, a, in, in a, the traditional TV sense. So... This episode, I reference these two things all the time, so I was excited once I realized what this episode was, and that it's uh, it's Hell in the Pacific, or Enemy Mine, a.k.a. Uh, two enemies are stranded in a spot, and they have to uh, get through it. In Hell in the Pacific, it's a Japanese soldier, an American soldier, the Japanese soldier's played by uh, friggin' uh, the guy who played Sanjiro, I mean, the guy who played Yojimbo, uh, uh, what's his name, Menafune. Oh, to- um, uh, Toshiro Mifune. Yeah, he plays the Japanese soldier in Hell in the Pacific. And then in Enemy Mine, it's an astronaut and an alien and they're, that are at war, and they're stranded on a pla- a whole planet together. Well, and see, the, the, the one that I think of is the Star Trek The Next Generation episode, Darmok, where it's uh, Picard and that alien whose language is completely in, like, metaphor. It's a, it's 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 an all-time great episode of Star Trek. 
Either way, you can apply this conceit to literally anything, and I'm all for it. Right. Uh, so the the idea is that like they're like brains brains still more upset at Binky as they kind of wonder like as Binky kind of wonders where his family is, and we d- because we're in the same spot, we do get a few cutaways. The the one that we go to with Binky here, just like maybe maybe they like maybe they meant not to pick him up. This was hilarious like it, and really it's the beginning of it it's uh binky's imagining his mom and dad at home on the couch reading newspapers and binky's mom's like oh no i was supposed to pick up binky from from uh from soccer uh like 10 minutes ago and then binky's dad just goes let's not pick him up <laughs> it's <incredible. laughs> like i it's, it's it's like and then like like I, his the other line I wrote down. He goes, "Think of the savings." Well, yeah, they're just talking about like, what if we just abandoned our son completely, and it's just like we would save a lot more on food. We wouldn't have to celebrate his birthday anymore. And then it goes to they're holding a yard sale of Binky's things, and they're literally just selling everything. As Binky is presumably still at the soccer field waiting to be picked up, they're essentially just leaving him for dead. And they use all the money they got on selling Binky's things to go on a cruise. And when they're on the cruise, they they're just like, "It's you know, I don't even miss our son." <laughs> what was what was his name again? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> like just having the time of their lives completely abandoning Binky. It set the tone for this episode in a really great way. Like this was really funny. Especially considering, like, all of this just gets funnier once we re- there's a big reveal at the end of how long they're waiting here, mm-hmm. and like all of this just gets funnier as a result. Well, and the important thing to remember from Brain firing up his Einstein program is that time is relative, which you know Einstein's theory of relativity, and we come back to that a little a couple of times uh, within this episode. In fact, we get a cutaway here from Brain who's uh, kind of, hyp- they're hypothesizing again where their parents could be. And, you know, Brain's like, maybe they got stuck in traffic. Mickey's like, on a Sunday? And Brain imagines that they're like, there's a big jam on the highway due to a duck being on the highway, which I loved. There's a, there's a quick shot here of, like, this this car stopped in front of a duck and a man just gets, gets up to go like, Arr! like, shake his fist at it. Uh, but then Binky's like, ducks don't normally go on, you know, the highway. And he's like, yeah, that's true. Maybe it could be ostriches, which is a terrifying thought. Imagine if you were, like, stuck on the highway because of ostriches. I mean, here in Dartmouth, uh, we have, you know, the goose that uh, people stop for because they know how to cross the street. Mm. But I just, like, the sh- I, ostriches are terrifying on their own. If you're, Then again, at least you're stuck in your car. And ostriches are ostriches violent? Like, do they hurt people? I, I can't. It seems like you're pretty. You got an ostrich thing, Will. I can't say with certainty, dude. It's ostrich. not just. It's not just me. A lot of people. A lot of Attack. people. A lot, a lot of people are skittish about ostriches. Like, it's not just me. Ostrich attack. I never implied it. I just, it seems like you, you're, it just seems like you're a little bit scared of ostriches. Well. I, uh, and I don't think I. Lucas, okay, are you not it, a little scared of ostriches? I don't think I've ever seen an ostrich in real life. Okay, here we go. Uh, July 30th, 2018, there is a video that's called Ostriches Are Evil, Ostriches Attacking Humans Compilation. Uh, so I will now use this to uh, decide if ostriches are evil. Okay, so this seems kind of cute. The ostrich is just cute. He's eating out of the guy's hand. Okay, well, <laughs> already this video is off to a biased start because the guy was feeding the ostrich and the, the ostrich ate the food happy as a clam, but then he put his finger out and then the ostrich bit his finger. I feel well, like he's getting just, just desserts for that. Well, see, okay. he's also in the safety of his car. So I kind of want to see like just ostriches running amok. I want to well, see an ostrich chase a guy. Well, see, I don't think that ostriches, here's the thing. Is it ostriches? Oh my God. This is IRL. What we were talking about in the Arthur episode. There's ostrich in the middle of traffic. See, the thing about ostriches is that it's not like, they're not like, I don't think that they're necessarily aggressive, but the thing is, is that they're giant birds with enormous beaks, and if they decide that they want you to die, you will die. You know? Like, I don't, I, mean, I don't trust them. I don't like birds in general. And then you just have these giant birds with huge legs that can run faster than you, and they're taller than you. 
I feel like we could argue about... I sent you the ostrich video, by the way. I feel like we talk about this all day, but I will leave you with this fact. Mm. Do I think I could beat an ostrich in a in in a fight to the death? Oh. Absolutely not. Okay, good. But, but, if you were like, here's... There's other animal. There's other animals where I would pick the ostrich over fighting that animal to the death, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? I, like, I, I would... There's many, many, many other animals I would rather fight an ostrich than. Not even, like, that, like... And, I, and I'm not talking about, like, natural predators here, either. Like, a comparable animal. Like, I'd rather fight an ostrich than a kangaroo any day of the week. I Sure. I mean, both intimidating in their in their own ways. Uh, yeah, no. I'm not a fan of ostriches. Anyway... <laughs> uh, I'd probably rather fight an ostrich than like a house trained dog that was trying to bite me. Uh, Ostrich's know. face is like at my height. I could just punch it. I could just punch. No, him. it's no, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I violated my own rules, which was I said I wasn't going to talk about this anymore because I knew we would just keep talking about it. Uh, Ostriches are taller than you. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I'm taller than you. Ostriches are taller than me. Do the math. That's all I'm saying. Okay, so uh, essentially, Brain goes on this flight of fancy where he's, you know, talking about ostriches on the highway. And then he says, maybe a rift in time and space opened and their their parents got sucked in. Because in this rift in time and space, time would be relative to them. What, what could seem like mere minutes would be, you know, dozens and dozens of years for Brain and Binky. So they get sucked into this very colorful wormhole, and they come out the other side, and uh, they finally end up at the soccer field, which is now very futuristic, and <laughs> Brain and Binky are now old men with beards down to the ground, and they're just like, sorry, we're a few minutes late, boys, and we get some, I like Brain's old man voice that his voice actor puts on, just like, a few years, no, a few minutes, we've been waiting 70 years for you young whippersnappers. <laughs> So I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, so Binky <laughs> brain sums this up, and then Binky just answers with, "You're really weird." <laughs> this is again. We always talk about. I love the combo, like weird character mashups. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Last episode we were talking about, oh, Muffy and Buster, what a fun pair. Binky and Brain, it's it's perfect. It's great. Yeah, no, it's very good. It's again a kind of a slobs versus snobs kind of thing, uh, with Brain taking the in, with taking the intellectual high ground versus Binky, who's a bit more of a realist, a bit more crude. Uh, it's 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 a pairing that works on paper and absolutely works in the episode as well. Um, but then Binky realizes that the later that their parents are, the more that they can guilt them, and we get this other cutaway back to Binky's house where he's having his 13th birthday of the year, the, and he's still milking the guilt of making him wait at the soccer field, as his parents, like, are literally cowering from him, of just like, well, we thought that maybe 13 birthdays in a year was enough, and then Binky goes into, like, do we need to remind you that I was out there in the cold, and, you know, all this kind of stuff, and he's like, maybe the police would have something to say about this if I, <laughs> or the local news media. He threatens to call the news, and then uh, Binky's dad rushes out to get him birthday presents. And <laughs> Binky has a great line where he's like, "Pick up some ice cream while you're gone. These this cake's looking a little bare." <laughs> great, it, it's very good, very Dudley Dursley of him. It's it's like almost uncharacteristically mean in a way, but uh, from Binky of all people. Like Binky and Brain are both excited at the idea of blackmailing their parents, essentially, except waiting for them to come is really, really boring. So they decide to do what people did before uh, TV and watch Well, right, watch so clouds. don't they talk about uh, uh, Binky, uh, Binky's talking about how he wished he had the TV, and uh, Brain talks about, you don't need TV to pass the time. A good book on 18th century land reform would do. Which I'm sure my wife agrees with. Um, yeah, exactly. And then so Liz's like, well, what did people do before that? They watched clouds. So they both have their own ways. This is a great gag, by the way, because any time I've tried to watch clouds in real life as a kid because people do it on TV, it's ended up like this. So Brain 
uh, takes that very literally, and he's literally and he's identifying the types of clouds. He's like, "There's a cumulus and a cirrostratus," and then Binky's like, uh, "It's like no, you're supposed to like like um, use your imagination." And he's like, "That cloud looks like a cotton swab." <laughs> a cotton swab, and 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 doesn't um, God, what's the other one? Is, is, uh, is there another one? I oh, I forget. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, because no, no. So Brain says it looks like an amoeba, mm. and and um, Binky says it looks like a cotton, like it's like a Q-tip but with no stem. Like it's like a cotton, <laughs> just the tip of a cotton swab. I think is what he says. It even threatens physical violence when Brain doesn't agree. The joke being that both of those are kind of like formless white things that just look like clouds, exactly, as opposed to like the clouds actually in the shape of something. Um, they eventually play like tic tac toe with twigs and rocks. And- That's another great gag where we kind of we we join the tic tac toe game in medias res, and and uh, brain goes another tie. <laughs> <laughs> and Binky gets the idea to spell out help with the uh with the stones and the twigs, and then brain's like Binky, that's if we're waiting for a for an airplane. <laughs> you know it's 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 really too small it's it's a it's a good gag and uh, eventually they get on their their knees and start begging for their moms to show up and pick them up and that's when i realized this episode's putting binky and brain through the five stages of gr- gr- uh, grief like they're getting angry first they were angry then they were depressed now they're bargaining well there's it's essentially like uh the arthur adaptation of that movie jerry where uh Casey Affleck and Matt Damon are walking around the desert for an hour and a half. I've never seen this. I don't know if you should rush out to see it necessarily. Um, But that's, that is exactly what happens in that movie. Um, So they, uh, they then decide that they're really hungry. Well, Biggie's like, I'm really hungry. And brain remembers that his mom packed him baby carrots in like a Ziploc bag (laughs) <laughs> to which Binky says, "Your mom works in an ice cream parlor, and all she packs is carrots," which is which I which I did like. Uh, but then Br- Brain's like, "I also have some turnip if you prefer," and we get. Oh, sorry. This is the Gus Van Sant movie. Yes, yes. Jer- uh, Jerry. I feel like I'd like this. Anyway, continue. Uh, well, I wouldn't put it past you. Um, and I like really boring crap <laughs> is the thing. So really, I, I'd, I'd, I'd be a fan of this. Really boring crap is what I've heard of that movie, <laughs> to be fair. Um, <laughs> so then Binky remembers. He goes over to his bag and he says, wait a second. I have some food, too. My mom packed them when she still loved me. Which I, I'm going to put the Arthur meme alert in there. I've definitely seen that shared on Twitter before. Very funny. Uh, and he so he has peanut butter crackers, which Brain is a little bit envious of. Binky, his initial instinct is to hoard it, but then he decides to share it with Brain. And he has uh, two juice boxes, so they each get one. Uh, Binky, who is very hungry, immediately goes to town on the peanut butter crackers and the juice, but then brain decides to ration it so that he can eat for another five hours. Uh, (laughs) Binky. I'm definitely in Binky's. And like Binky immediately goes to like the classic desert Island conceit of like, he's like not a second goes by after he's completely eaten his peanut butter cracker and drank all of his juice that he's hallucinating. (laughs) And it's the, the, the grapes or they, the cranberries on the cranberry juice uh, uh, start telling uh, Binky, they're like, it was your juice in the first place. <laughs> Binky says, the cranberries are right. <laughs> so they struggle for the juice box and then end up just wasting it all in this. If fr- only he had said the cranberries are a lot right, I don't have to let it linger. <laughs> uh, I don't get it. What's the, oh, you'll, the listeners will hopefully email and fill you in on that one. Oh, is it a cranberry song? Yes, this uh, is covered, so. Understood. In my head. In my head. <laughs> um, so Arthur and... B- As they're fighting into the soccer field, uh, Arthur and Buster pull up with Buster's mom. They realize they left something. And Buster looks down at the help, which is which he takes as being kelp. Oh, my goodness. This is a this is my favorite part of the whole episode, is this whole segment right here, where they, they go to f- chase after the dog to attach a message to it. And then uh, Arthur and Buster comically show up at that time and be like, "Oh, nobody's here. Get these shoes." Yeah, it's just another another classic of these types of stories of that like they're almost saved, but something distracts them. Uh, so they they drive away. Binky and Brain are 
Oh, did I? Oh, did I miss this? Um, I think I did actually. There is a part. It, it's it's after they fight uh, for um, the juice box, and they start talking about wrestling. That's right. Uh, you know, Brain is initially like, "Oh, but that wrestling's fake," and Binky's like, "No, no, no, no." Uh, let me tell you about Tiny Tommy Tornado, who is able to beat all of the all of the bigger guys because he has the best moves. Very much the Rey Mysterio of this wrestling federation. They start talking about it because Brain says that because Binky gets the last of the cranberry juice and says Brain Brain says it wasn't a fair fight because Binky's bigger than him. So he tells about Tiny Tommy Tornado, and Binky like offers to show him a wrestling move. And then ends up getting the move put on him, which he calls a reverse hammer flip, and <laughs> which is not real, by the way. No, no, it looks it looks pretty much just like an arm bar takedown kind of thing, like just a straight arm bar. But then mm. Brain suddenly realizes perhaps there is a bit of value in uh, in wrestling, and so they kind of shake hands as they're uh, as you know after uh, Buster and Arthur pull up and. Uh, then Brain's peanut butter crackers gets eaten by just a uh, roaming dog who B- Brain calls a loathsome cur. <laughs> Do you think the peanut butter... Again, ag- again, roaming claw- dogs. Maybe it was... Uh, 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 I have already forgotten how to pronounce his name. Uh, Diogenes? Diogenes? Diogenes is... The, the layers upon layers like George Lucas would say it's like poetry the stanzas rhyme <laughs> uh, do you think that the peanut butter crackers would hurt the dog no peanut butter is fine for dogs is it what's oh yeah, no oh, oh I'm thinking of chocolate you're thinking of chocolate chocolate would kill a dog dogs love peanut butter they eat it all the time okay gotcha that's good um, so the- <laughs> it's funny to put it on their gums because it looks like they're talking uh, so we are not quite We don't get quite to acceptance here as Brain and Binky are distraught. There's there's no more food. They see Arthur and Buster drive away. That's their last hope. And then they kind of just like both lie down in the grass and Brain says, Binky, we're going to die. (laughs) I always appreciate Arthur does that every once in a while. Like they say something like that and it's like surprisingly grim. Well, it's not even just Binky, we're going to die. He says, and this is brain this is the rational one right goes soon the night and then the wolves that's right binky we're going to die so it's not just that they're gonna die they're gonna die like liam neeson in that movie the gray yeah and get eaten to death by wolves it's it's so it, it is such a grim turn and made all the funnier by the eventual reveal which we're just about to get to and they both kind of lie down and essentially commit themselves to dying. It's just they're just like it was nice knowing you, brain. You too, Binky. Like they sound all weak. They've got bags under their eyes. We get a POV of like brain closing his eyes, and then we hear brain and Binky's moms, and uh, they wake up and they're saved, so they don't have to die. As they go back to the car, it's revealed that um, uh, Binky and Brain's moms were both going to like doctor's appointments in the same office, so they decided to carpool together, which is what took them longer. And then Binky's like, that's what took you so long? We've been out here for hours. To which Binky's mom says, hours? We're just 15 minutes late. And they're like, 15 minutes? To which Binky immediately, after having Brain explain it to him, uh, says it's all about Einstein's theory of relativity. So it actually felt longer for them than it was for their parents. And the episode ends with them uh, going to... So near the end, near the beginning of the episode, Bra- uh, Brain said his mom was going to take him to the library. Binky said his mom was going to take him to the movies. And so Brain's mom says, you know, we can still get to the library if we, if we hurry. And then Brain says, are you kidding? World of Wrestling is on. I don't want to w- miss a single second. So nothing like a near-death experience to turn you into a wrestling fan. And uh, that is that's where that episode uh, wraps up, if you can believe it. Before we talk about that one, let's go back to to Tibble the Truth. Uh, Lucas, what did you make of this? So I at first I was like, okay, this episode's just kind of okay. Like, there's nothing really that special about to Tibble the Truth. Kind of a funny episode, a Tibbles episode. It felt really short. Uh, but I was thinking about it, and the thing that I really like about that episode is it's actually kind of a more complicated lesson or more nuanced lesson 
uh, than you would think. Mm-hmm. Because uh, usually a show like this, the moral would simply be, you know, you shouldn't lie. You should always tell the truth. You should be truthful to old people. But the, the Tibbles run into something that, you know, at, at some point I've had to, in my adult life, sort of recognize in my own behavior and that in in trying to be truthful, they kind of they overdo it or they overshare or they're they're tr- they're not uh, mindful of people's feelings, even though they are telling the truth or how they really feel. And I think that's an important lesson for kids to learn at a young age is that, yes, you should always be truthful and you shouldn't lie to people, but also you should be mindful of other people's feelings. And you should also just, you know, try and be a nice person and walk the line be- between being truthful and honest and, and, and oversharing or, you know, saying the first thing that hops into your head. So I really liked that and I really liked that aspect to it. But besides uh, uh, sort of the unique moral, um, kind of just a, a regular run-of-the-mill Arthur episode, in my opinion. Nothing, like, too special. Yeah, I think that is a good point, that there is, um, there is like you said, you, you did say it quite well, a nuanced moral to this. And it kind of didn't hit me until the end myself. Um it is, like I said, there's kind of a gradient with how the Tibbles act here uh, in terms of like going from lying to telling the truth, but in the wrong way to eventually learning the right way. Um, yeah, it's, it is kind of just a bit of an average episode. It definitely seems aimed at younger kids because they are using younger kids as the main characters. But there are elements in here that I really like. Um, I, I really liked the dream sequence with them in jail. I thought that was very funny. Um, Agreed. And every time they checked in with Buster was brilliant. And I really liked the sweet moment that they got. There's a little bit of character development to the to the Tibbles here as they're really young and learning a lesson. And you get the affirmation that, yeah, they are each other's best friends and which is really sweet. It kind of helps to make them feel less like, you know, tools that the writers use when they need like the bad kids. And it makes them feel a bit more bit more human. So that was that was nice. It's. You know, it's not anything spectacular, but uh, it's it, it, it has its uses for sure. Um, waiting to go, I, I, I'd say this is definitely one of my favorites of the season so far. It's funny because a lot of times when you and I will watch an episode that we're not especially inspired by, we don't have a lot of notes. I feel like I didn't have a lot of notes this time because I didn't want to write down every single thing about the episode. Like, pretty much every single... Um, set piece in this episode was very funny or very creative or both. Like when I say, you know, I laughed at, you know, Binky's dad saying, let's not pick him up. Like I'm, I nearly had to pause the episode. I was laughing so hard. I was eating supper as I was watching that episode and I spit my food out. What do you like that whole segment, that whole segment, let alone the whole episode is really a laugh riot. Like, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and, from and, my mom packed them back when she still loved me to the cranberries are right. Like soon the the night, then the wolves. Like there's so many quotable lines in this episode. Yeah, and uh, also again dynamics at play here, and I think that's maybe one of the bigger strengths of Arthur going forward is that we're willing to experiment with uh the dynamics in an episode the partnerships and this is another one which we haven't really seen we've seen brain play off of other characters in a single format like arthur or francine but we've never seen him and binky and it seems again so natural given kind of both of their characters and it worked out really well and i also thought it kind of tickled me the idea of arthur having a bottle episode because i don't think they need to necessarily uh, they don't necessarily need one like a standard, uh, you know, modern sitcom, live action sitcom needs a bottle episode to like save money or what have you, or a d- drama of any kind. Uh, but it was kind of a, it was an interesting format that is immediately memorable. It's like oh, the one where Brain and Binky uh get left, like they like they don't get picked up. You know which one you're talking about. And it's I bet it's going to be really fun to go back to. So, yeah, uh, top marks for this episode. I really liked it. Again, we talked about this before in that this kind of conceit kind of works no matter what characters you apply to it. And we happen to actually like Arthur characters quite a bit, but it worked for Star Trek. It worked for an alien and a human man. And it worked for when it was an American and a Japanese soldier. It's kind of a timeless uh storytelling trope and i always get a kick out of it but 
it's not just that that makes this episode succeed. It's, again, like, this episode's just really sharply written. Like, it's Arthur comedy writing at its finest, and I think the writers have a lot to do with, you know, sort of contrasting brain against Binky, and that's a, a, a ripe vein for or all kinds of high, hijinks. But it's even more so than that, like, the idea that, like, Binky would write help out with pebbles, and then Brain would be like, that's not gonna help us at all, and then they get distracted, and then, like, Arthur pulls up and mistakes it for kelp. It's just so creative and funny. Um, it's just kind of ridiculous. Like, Arthur's like, is it Buster who's asking Arthur what kelp is in that yes. part? Where he's like, what is kelp? <laughs> like, it's just, it's great stuff. Really funny episode. Uh, I, definitely one of the best of the season thus far. Absolutely. Um, and I look forward to more stuff like this. So hopefully we, hopefully we continue on this path. Hey, Binky episodes pretty much always deliver. So never, ever doubt it. And that'll do it for this episode of Elwood City Limits. Uh, Lucas, I don't know if you realize this, but next time we are celebrating a huge milestone in every sense of the word with, well, with Arthur and with ourselves. Do you know? Oh, do, wow. you, do you know what? Do, do you know what's going to be happening the is, next is time? Next one is next episode. Our, uh, is it episode one hundred? Are we doing episode one hundred next? The next episode. Elwood City turns 100, and b- by definition, so do we, as we go into episode 100. That's crazy. What, what episodes are we watching for episode 100? Episode 100. Wait, what? Wait, what? what do you, do, we're, like, we're, we're watching Elwood City turns 100. That's the, that's oh, the episode. No. Yeah, because... Wait. So we well think about it. Every episode of this show, we've been watching an episode of Arthur. So we've been following them in production order. So we're coming up to the one hundredth episode of Arthur, which was oh, Elwood City Turns One Hundred. I, I, I am such a fool. I was like, <laughs> what a coincidence! I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> yes, no. In fact, we will be we will be talking about Elwood City Turns One Hundred the next time, and celebrating one hundred full episodes. Of this little podcast. Oh well, we got to do something about. Li- hey, if you're still listening, if you're in the Elwood City limits, and it's okay if we don't get any of these, but I really got to say, if you have a favorite memory of these last 100 episodes, please send us an email and tell us which what what was your favorite episode or what was your favorite moment for between me and Will. I mean, gosh, I don't want to get all misty eyed before we even get to the hundredth episode, but we've been doing this for almost three years now, right? So. I've moved. We've had some big. We both moved. Uh, I got married. City. You got married. We've had some big life change. I went to school. I went back to school. Uh, you know, lots happened in three years, um, and this has been one of the only sort of kind of consistencies week to week. Uh, so yeah, hundred episodes is a big deal. It's true. That's a great idea, Lucas. Um, if you have any Elwood City Limits memories that you'd like to share with us, uh, make sure to get in contact with us via the email or via social media, or if you're one of our patrons on the Discord, we'd love to hear from you. What- even if it's just like, uh, even if it's just like, you know, where did you first hear about the show or something like that, I'd love to hear it. And, and will remind me, we should make a post on the Discord asking for that as well. For sure, and uh, I think, and I have a couple of favorite memories of ours that I that I'd like to share. Uh, so I think ne- next episode is going to be a lot of fun, as they always are. I you know wouldn't be doing this for a hundred episodes if I didn't enjoy it. But uh, next one's going to be a little something special, and then not too long after episode one hundred, we are going to be celebrating three years. Uh, of doing this silly show, so we've got a lot to think about. You've got a lot to to uh, to go on, and goodness gracious, if you haven't, uh, uh, I can't imagine a backlog of a hundred episodes. So if you're new to the show, uh, you've got your work cut out for you. Thank you for joining us uh, for episode ninety nine. As we look forward to one hundred, uh, my name's Will Young, and for Lucas Mancini. I'm 13. You really think I want to play with a plastic cow? See, that was the problem here is that I wrote down so many quotes that I was like, one of these is definitely going to be stepping on Lucas's final line. So <laughs> I apologize. I said that one earlier in the episode. I th- I really thought it was going to be from Waiting to Go. That's why I, I had to avoid all the Waiting to Go ones because there were so many to talk about. I could have just went with Think of the Savings. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not pick him up. <laughs> 
All right, we'll see you when uh, we hit the triple digits next time.